First, these jurisdictions are the state's true competitors in terms of the labor workforce. For purposes of recruitment and retention, this is where VOC employees go to look for other employment. And recruitment and retention obviously is identified as a consideration in the MOU. Second, the state has a long history of utilizing county classifications when comparing DOC-specific classifications. In the state's 2010 salary survey, which included the DOC-specific classifications, the state used counties and other public and private sector jurisdictions within the state. Third, the state's 2014 salary survey for non-DOC-specific classifications, that would be the electricians and the administrative assistants and so forth. That survey uses counties and other public and private sector jurisdictions within the state. And what that means is that if the arbitrator were to decline to use counties for the DOC specific classifications, an anomalous inconsistency would result within the bargaining unit. The methodology and result of the comparable analysis would depend on whether the classification at issue is DOC specific or not. Office assistants working for DOC would benefit by the inclusion of county data, but correctional officers would not. Fourth, we note that the state salary survey for the Washington State Patrol includes county data. And fifth, the counties have job classifications that are true comparables. They're easily identifiable as comparables to those in this bargaining unit. There is one other thing that I need to make note of in the opening statement, and that is that uh, the state has made an 11th hour change in its approach to the comparable analysis, and we would submit that that change is both improper and incorrect. Mr. Arbitrator, you will recall that you directed the parties to exchange their comparable data and analysis by August 1st. In fact, that deadline was set almost a year ago in September of last year, and the parties complied with this deadline. The state submitted both its 2014 total compensation survey and its correction specific final report from Siegel by that deadline. Likewise, the union submitted its analysis performed by the Tedesco law firm as I just described it, and yet we were surprised to find that at the very last minute, and I do mean that, it was within the last few days, the state now seeks to take a completely different approach with respect to the data, the comparable classification, and the methodology with respect to the position of correctional officer presumably because it is the classification with the largest number of incumbents. This new study contains elements that cannot be thoroughly reviewed and analyzed by the union with adequate time to respond, and it should be rejected. Moreover, the evidence will establish that the new study contains significant errors that skew the results in the state's favor and that are inconsistent with every other earlier study conducted by the state itself. Incredibly, though, even after this last minute inaccurate and some might say desperate rejiggering. And even if the arbitrator were to accept the state's proposal to focus solely on the 10-year or 15-year officer, correctional officers still are found to fall 8 to 10 percent behind the average of the comparable jurisdictions. The state also seeks to diminish the yawning gap between the pay of DOC employees and their counterparts by asking the arbitrator to compare the top step of state employees pay with the mid-step of their comparables. In other words, as a matter of policy, the state would have you hold that the most experienced senior DOC employees should be paid the same as those in other jurisdictions who have not yet achieved full journey status. Council's articulated rationale for such a seesaw approach to compensation, however clever, will not withstand scrutiny. The union's proposal on comparables contains a provision that would enable employees to catch up to the comparables by the end of the collective bargaining agreement, with half of the gap closing on the last day of the agreement. Specifically, after all other increases are adopted, the union would propose closing 25% of any remaining gap at the beginning of year one, another 25% at the beginning of year two, and the remaining half at the end of the contract. There is, from our perspective, simply no reason why State of Washington DOC employees should continue to lag behind the average of the comparables. The union's proposal also contains provision to address supervisory compression by creating a minimum five range 
or 12.5% spread between classifications and their immediate subordinates. This proposal is necessary to address a problem within the existing DOC compensation structure, namely that there is a high degree of compression between some supervisors and their immediate subordinates. The evidence will establish that the most challenging problem exists as between officers and sergeants. Officers are disinclined to promote to sergeant because there is currently only a four range or 10% pay differential, a difference they can easily make uh, by working an overtime shift. The additional compensation simply is not adequate for the additional responsibility, and this is borne out by comparable analysis. Mr. Ageson will testify that on a nationwide basis, the spread between correction officers and sergeants is typically 15% or more, and the comparable analysis undertaken by the Tedesco Law Group will bear this out. Finally, making this change will not create a compression problem at higher levels of the structure because, the evidence will show, lieutenants are paid well above sergeants. The union will demonstrate that there are numerous other classifications affected by the same problem. The union, you will see in our proposal, also in, uh, re requests that nurses, not just registered nurses, but LPNs, receive the supplemental shift premium in Article 3216, and that overtime exempt employees receive $125 for each day on standby status, like their comparables in other jurisdictions and contract worker counterparts at DOC, rather than the current $25 rate in the contract. This proposal is found in Article 3217. Now faced with the vast weight of evidence that justifies substantial wage increases for the entire bargaining unit, the state emphasizes issues around its ability to pay, and in particular the state's overall financial condition. The union will offer several responses. First, in the interest arbitration context, arbitrators have consistently held that even in difficult economic times, ability to pay is one factor that must be weighed in the context of evaluating all of the other considerations, and not a trump card that justifies complete inaction where there are wage deficiencies. And this point is especially true in this context because as you are aware, and as the Memorandum of Understanding makes clear, the award that you will issue is not binding on the Office of Financial Management or the Washington State Legislature. The Office of Financial Management must still certify to the government, governor, excuse me, that the award is financially feasible, and all state expenditures constitutionally must be approved by the legislature. In this way, the award that you are issuing is declaratory as to what compensation structure should exist for DOC, or said differently, the state still holds a financial feasibility trump card. As to the state's ability to pay relative to the evidence you'll hear in the hearing, the union will introduce evidence to establish three very important points. First, in percentage terms, the state of Washington spends less of its general fund budget on corrections than any other western state, and substantially less than the average of all western states. Therefore, as a percentage of general fund spent, corrections is a very low percentage. And in this light, the state's ability to pay, when viewed as a budgetary choice relative to other budgetary choices, we would submit as substantially untapped. Furthermore, the general economic trend nationwide and in terms of state revenues is up, not down. The evidence will establish that while the future is never certain, all indicators suggest that the state can expect continued growth and therefore a continued increase in general fund revenue. And finally, the union will submit evidence that the state has internal service funds with substantial fund balances that are not only available for general fund purposes, but as a matter of federal law, those excess fund balances should be returned to the general fund. Mr. Arbitrator, uh, this case is of critical importance to all of the correctional workers and to their union it really tests whether long-standing and serious compensation deficiencies that now threaten operational efficacy will endure simply because they are expensive to fix. The department, the state, and its citizens benefit every hour of every day that its correctional workers put themselves in harm's way for the sake of the department and the public at large. And it cannot continue to be that these employees continue to internalize some portion 
of the cost of the work by being undercompensated. They deserve fair compensation for this critical public safety work, compensation that recognizes the harms they absorb by for virtue of performing the work, compensation that is aligned with their counterparts in other comparable jurisdictions, and compensation growth that allows them to maintain those standards instead of forever backsliding against a rising cost of living. Thank you. Yes.